My name is Carl Teichman. I'm Director of Government Community Relations with Illinois Wesleyan. Uh, the university, along with the museum, are the sponsors uh, for this series. Today, I think we've got a very interesting uh, uh, program to offer uh, with uh, Rochelle Gridley, who's the Assistant Archivist for the McLean County uh, Museum of History, and she's going to be talking about the panograph and the images to inform and inspire. Um, so without further ado, I'll turn it over to Rochelle. Welcome, Rochelle. Good morning. Um, this morning, I'm going to be sharing a PowerPoint. So I'm going to go ahead and just start sharing my screen. The panograph has a rich history of being a newspaper that supported its community and provided world, national, and local news of the highest quality. It is a history well worth preserving. Here at the McLean County Museum of History, we have the rich resource of the panograph negatives. And these negatives provide us with a fascinating window into our own history as interpreted by the panograph reporters. As you have doubtless learned before, this museum is not funded by county taxes. The digitization pro project has received its funding from grants from national and state sources, such as the State Library and the Institute of Museum and Library Services, and very importantly, the support of this community. Earlier this year, we uploaded the 100,000th image in the collection, an exciting milestone in our mission to digitize a million images. My hope today is that I will give you new ways to think about the images that you see and that I will give you new ideas about the kind of images you can search for in the collection. Now the Panagraph started producing its own photos during the 1920s. Reportedly, only two reporters had any talent for photography at that time, and we know the paper also relied on local commercial photographers for images. The Panagraph demanded photos from all its reporters, including the out-of-county reporters who were not professional journalists. All the reporters at the Panagraph were expected to take their own photographs because there were no professional photographers on staff. Over the years, the Panagraph reporters would receive multiple awards for their photography. This image of apple pickers at the Birkelbaugh Orchard is one of a series that is the earliest in our collection. In 1927, the Panagraph purchased the Bulletin, their only competition in Bloomington. The purchase increased the paper's operating expenses, but even after the stock market crash in 1929, the owners continued to put money into the paper. Buying the Bulletin meant taking on that subscription base, as well as the Bulletin employees. Editorial expense had doubled after the purchase, with 50% of all the costs of the paper being salaries. Another investment was the photo engraving department in 1931. Engraving was the process by which images were added to the paper. By doing the engraving in-house, the pantograph could produce images on a faster schedule. The photo engraving department was run as a separate business and charged the different departments of the paper for its services. The paper could also provide photographic services for advertisers at a better rate than local photographers and engravers. This image shows the engraver in 1949 explaining the engraving camera to two visitors to the panograph. In 1935, the Panagraph erected a new larger building. In this image, the workers are placing the largest steel beam that would support the heavy machinery used to print the paper. With this building, the Panagraph demonstrated its faith in the future of Bloomington Normal and its people 
in the dark days of the depression. Now the Panagraph had a clear mission to educate and inform its readers as did any newspaper. In the 1920s, the city of Bloomington was voting on whether to create a new source of city water and a residential water service. J.W. Orcutt, the managing editor for the Panagraph believed that the paper should not only give the news but should present it in such a way as to permit the public to do their own enlightened thinking. In Bloomington, manufacturers spent thousands of dollars each year softening the water for the manufacturing processes. And this caused businessmen to fear that other cities would tempt away the railroads and other manufacturers with softer water. Another water issue was public health. Bloomington had a bad record as a city with a high incidence of typhoid, which was connected to the use of private wells and backyard privies. The Panagraph presented the water facts to the public in great detail in the belief that the public should have all the facts in order to make the right decision in the voting booth. Ultimately, Bloomington, Lake Bloomington was created by damming Money Creek, giving us a reliable water supply and a large recreational lake with camps and lake homes. The camps at Lake Bloomington were an engaging source of photos. At Lake Bloomington, the Boy Scouts had Camp Heffernan, where hundreds of scouts enjoyed outdoor activities and camping. This image of three scouts in a bucket brigade would inspire any young boy to join the scouts. This image is filled with action and intensity, just as the editors demanded and as the photographers hoped. It is from the family circle, the employee newspaper, that we learn about the Panagraph's photography goals. Reporters were advised in how to take an effective photo that would print well by placing their subject in a simple background and centering the subject in the image. Subjects should always be doing something, not simply gazing at the camera. Camp Limberlost at Lake Bloomington was a camp sponsored by the Kiwanis. At Camp Limberloss, disadvantaged children of Bloomington Normal who had no chance of enjoying a camping experience with the Scouts or 4-H could have a week of sunshine and physical activity. The camp was just one of the many community chess charities supported by the Panagraph through advertising of the fundraising campaign in images and articles each year. During the depression, many WPA and National Youth Administration projects gave economic relief in McLean County. Buildings were added at ISU, Wilder Field was built at Wesleyan, and post offices were added at Bloomington and Normal, in addition to many other buildings. The parks, including Lake Bloomington, received many improvements. A National Youth Administration project created this picturesque walking trail at Lake Bloomington in 1936. Now by 1946, the public beach at Lake Bloomington was allowed to deteriorate and close. The Panagraph scolded the city for allowing this public resource, which had been purchased with tax dollars, to fall into disrepair. A beautiful swimming beach was no longer maintained by the city and lifeguards no longer patrolled the beach. The following year, Bloomington allowed three men to manage and maintain the beach for the use of the public. One of the outstanding aspects of the Pandagraph newspaper was its agricultural coverage. Frank Bill, in the center of this picture, was the agricultural editor throughout the 30s, 40s, and 50s, 
And he was also the top photographer with the pantograph in the 1920s. Totally self-taught, Bill served as a guide to news reporters and county reporters. Here, he shows off a new attachment on, to his camera to the other staff reporters. All the reporters used speed graphic Graflex cameras, which were made specifically for newspaper photographers. The cameras were very complex. They had three viewfinders, two different types of shutters, and the film was loaded into the camera one image at a time. It was said that by carrying a Graflex, even an ordinary citizen could gain access to a police scene or a fire because everyone knew that the Graflex was the camera of journalists. Now, Frank Bill was well known for his aerial camera work, which was accomplished with the assistance of Pantograph's own scoop, the airplane in this photo. The scoop was outfitted with a Graflex aerial camera and it was flown by Art Carnahan on the left. Bill's reputation as a photographer was such that the state of Illinois hired him to take the pictures for a state survey of airports in the 1930s. The pantograph also used the scoop to influence local businessmen to develop the Bloomington Municipal Airport, an essential amenity in the economic success of Bloomington Normal even today. In 1938, Frank Bill flew in the pantograph scoop to Washington, D.C. to meet the Secretary of Agriculture, Henry Wallace. Here he is with Lorraine Merwin, Charles Driver, and pilot Art Carnahan preparing to leave. For weeks before he left, Bill printed the letters of farmers with their questions for Wallace. Bill had a private meeting with Wallace and then gave a speech to agriculture officials in DC about Illinois farmers and their concerns. Bill then returned to Bloomington and reported Wallace's answers to his readers. Through the pantograph, McLean County had the ear of Washington, DC. After the formation of the Great Dust Bowl of the 1930s, agriculture edu educators urged farmers to employ terracing, crop rotation, and contour plowing, which could all be shown to great advantage in aerial photography. This image was made during a Farm Bureau air tour for 4-H club members. The club members could see from the air where topsoil was washed away and where terracing and waterways had preserved the soil. The Panagraph had a number of events it sponsored that supported the community. Agriculture was supported by the Panagraph Farm Day, when the Panagraph would bring in speakers and dignitaries to an all day event on a local farm with experts in educational booths. Some years, the day would be dedicated to a specific crop such as alfalfa in 1936. In this image, a pit silo is being formed by a tractor at the ISNU farm in Normal, Illinois. The pantograph employed both men and women as reporters. In 1950, Wilma Tolley was a features reporter and recorded the waning days of the interurban in a photo story. The interurban railway was threatening to shut down at that time. And although this move was resisted by the communities that depended on the interurban for freight service and personal transportation, the bell had rung and the private automobile had knocked out the interurban. We can see in this image that ridership was not heavy in 1950. The interurban, which often ran with a single car, required two men to operate, 
Here, the conductor operates the switch at Mackinac Junction. After the interurban ceased service in 1953, little towns and their businesses along its route would wither and die without the interurban. Businesses on the west side of Bloomington were also concerned about their ability to survive without the interurban. Safety in the home was a frequent subject in the panograph. Bathroom safety, tripping hazards, and fire dangers were vividly illustrated with staged photos. Here, a little girl plays with a dangerous extension cord and fan. But in 1944, no mention was made of the inadequate cage around the fan blades. These public safety illustrations helped readers think about the day-to-day -day hazards in their home and in public. Children and bicycles were also a frequent safety theme with a growing number of automobiles, buses, and trucks, bicycle riding became more hazardous. This image brought home to families and children that bicycle safety was important and that careless or reckless riding could have fatal outcomes. Now, farm safety was of special concern as powered implements on the farm continued to develop. The corn picker, which would pick the corn by twisting away the corn stalk and throwing the corn cob into a wagon was an incredibly dangerous device. A joint in the power takeoff from the tractor to the picker was directly under the seat of the tractor. And I'm pointing to the guard around this power takeoff in the detail of the photo. And this posed a constant danger of catching loose clothing and pulling the driver off his seat. Now, during a two week period in the harvest of 1938, three Illinois farmers lost their lives and 12 lost their fingers or hands in amputations due to improper use of corn pickers. In November of 1938, Frank Bill, asked a local railroad safety expert, Orrin Ashworth, to visit a farm with him to examine a corn picker and give tips to farmers on how to avoid accidents. The Agriculture Safety Board instructed farmers to avoid loose clothing and to never place their hands near the picker when it was running. Ashworth went one step further, and he also advised that the corn picker must always be turned off before the farmer left his seat on the tractor. Herman Feist, the farmer here, had been using corn pickers since 1926. And on his tractor, as we can see, he used the appropriate shields on his equipment as seen under the tractor seat. During World War II, it would have been difficult not to know how you could help with the war effort because the pantograph informed readers of every paper, rubber, and scrap metal drive. By reading the paper, the reader would know exactly what items to have ready for boys and girls collecting scrap. Ladies working for the Red Cross and other relief organizations knew when work was being done and the call for women to become nurses or to enlist in the army or navy never ended until the war was over. Here, a boy is collecting rubber boots for a scrap drive in Delavan. Now, with all the salvaging, it was important to take care of the rubber, metal, and paper items you did have. The pantograph addressed these concerns as well. You could be a good citizen by cleaning your rubber boots and storing them properly. A photo story in the pantograph showed you just how to do this. Typewriters were also an item to be preserved and cared for. Joan Shields, Viv Trimble, and Louise Frawley are maintaining a typewriter here. 
And the standing photographer's lamp reminds us that photographer's equipment was in short supply during World War II. At the pantograph, reporters were asked to carefully plan their photos to reduce the use of film and when possible, to take photos out of doors in natural light rather than using flash bulbs. Mary Ward, a Clinton state reporter, even purchased her own standing lights to avoid using flash bulbs. Now the panograph was determined to have photos from all over their territory. And to this end, they hired reporters in every county on piecework terms. Here, Mary Ward of Clinton sets up a photo of Lizzie Guy and her needlework in 1941. The state reporters, as they were called, mailed in their photos or negatives in special pink envelopes. The envelopes were pink so that the Blo Blo Bloomington Post Office could expeditiously sort those envelopes and have them ready when the pantograph runners came to the post office every hour. In the 1940s, the pantograph set photograph quotas for each state, state reporter based on the number of subscription holders in his or her district. Failure to fill that quota could result in dismissal. Now there is an old adage, a picture is worth a thousand words. And the panograph editors disputed this adage. A paper could be published without photos, but it could never be published without words. The editors knew, however, that pictures added interest and information. Readers wrote letters of appreciation when a picture from their town appeared in the pantograph. In 1932, the pantograph hired a professional interviewer to perform a 14-week survey interviewing 1,000 readers of the panograph to learn their likes and dislikes. And one of the results was readers want pictures. Each issue was carefully planned to have a certain number of images. And each month, pictures from each city in the subscription area would appear in proportion to the number of subscribers in said area. Now the pantograph strategy for engaging readers with photographs put the focus on the little people sometimes. Any person in town who was doing their bit for the community, especially those who would not usually receive any recognition, was searched out for inclusion in the newspaper's coverage. Hence, the homey columns of the 1930s called along the road or around the town, where rural families were featured and small stories about Bloomington normal residents appeared on set days. In the along the road column, we have a rich source of images of one room schoolhouses and their students. In 1938, the work of Eleanor Gentis, the teacher of the Brady School near Shinoa, was recognized in a four picture spread. The rural school teacher filled every position in the rural school. She was the lunch lady, janitor, school nurse, and teacher. Here Gentis is filling the school furnace. The around the town column usually featured little children, their pets, or other individuals living in Bloomington Normal. The picture would accompany a cute quote from the child or quippy comments about their activities. Mary Eilers received her cat Boots from a friend who moved away. And although the family had never had a pet before, Boots soon became the center of attention whose every desire was promptly granted. 
Now, the same day that Richardson took pictures of Mary Eilers, he visited two other houses in the 800 block of Jefferson Street, photographing the children and talking with them. The Along the Road column recorded the history of communities that no longer exist and their disappearing culture. Randolph, Illinois was one such community and it was the subject of an Along the Road column. Here, little five girls at the Pleasant Valley School prepare snacks for the school Thanksgiving Day lunch in their pilgrim costumes in 1937. Charles Driver visited the general store in Randolph to dispute an article in a big city newspaper, claiming that all the general stores had closed and that they were just a bit of dead and gone history. In Randolph, the general store had no shortage of business, even if some of it was only observers at a checkers game. The Pleasant Valley School, as well as many others in McLean County would close before 1949, and the post office in Randolph would close in 1968. The panograph also reassured readers. If tainted milk was a subject of concern, the panograph would present stories on the measures taken by farmers, and milk inspectors to make sure milk in Bloomington was absolutely pure and healthy. A five picture strip gave facts about five different tests to assure the purity of milk in a local laboratory. The panograph also exposed a tainted milk incident in Minear, Illinois during the forties and was responsible for the temporary closing of that dairy. In 1945, wartime shortages continued to affect farmers and builders. New machinery was unavailable and old machinery was breaking down. In response, farmers developed new skills. Adult education classes led by farm bureaus and high schools taught mechanics and welding to farmers who then altered each to his own purpose, old equipment, or they created wholly new tools in their own workshops. Lester Feaster, as always, was ahead of other farmers and was developing new machines and tools in the 1930s. He developed this seed corn grater in 1938. It was a gigantic contraption, well over twice his height. He called it a shaker because vibrations caused the corn to fall through holes of gradated sizes. The next year, his newer corn grater was less than half the size of the first. A few years later, he would market the jitterbug grater, a machine about the size of a jukebox. By using this machine, Farmers could sort their seed corn by size and improve the price they would receive. Simon Altman, an Illinois champion corn husker and a mechanical wizard created his own tools. Here he is with a power disc tiller of his own creation in 1946. His pride in his work is evidenced in his smile, although he looks away from the camera. August Hawkins of McLean built a small tractor from a 1928 Chevrolet automobile to which he added a transmission, a second engine and a weighted back wheels. Pictures like these encouraged other farmers to attend adult education classes and create their own tools. Sadly, this creativity would cease to a large extent as factories increased production and tools and equipment became more and more complex. Now the dog in this image may not have normally been riding on a tractor and was probably added by the photographer. 
their experience told them that an animal in the picture would draw more eyes and attention. Panograph newspaper carriers were always treated like kings at the Panograph. They were given trips to professional baseball games, carnivals, and picnics. And in 1938 and 1939, a select few carriers were honored with a day at the Panograph. The boys shadowed a reporter, editor, or printer, and were introduced to just how a paper was made. Here, one carrier takes part in the development of an image in the dark room. These three boys learned about the engraving process, and one is about to cut a photo engraving for insertion in the paper. Note that one of the boys is taking a picture with one of the speed graphic Graflex cameras. Readers of the paper learned about the operations of the newspaper and hundreds of boys throughout central Illinois thought about how fun it would be to be a pantograph carrier after seeing the large photo story on the carrier's day at the pantograph. Now the pantograph did not leave out women in their mission of improvement and information. A regular column, home, club, and community featured traditional women's subjects, including recipes, nutrition, child rearing, husband management, and fashion advice every day. The Panagraph sponsored a cooking school with a professional cook several times during the depression. And this image from 1937 presents a thoroughly modern kitchen an electric range, refrigerator, and tiled walls and linoleum floors made for easy cleaning and a sanitary kitchen. And the Panagraph was a good friend to appliance salesmen and home remodelers as well. In 1949, Lolita Driver, the woman's editor, began a column that ran in the Panagraph for 10 years. She called it Professional Profiles, and it featured working women in McLean County. The column reflected the fact that more and more women were working outside the home and revealed that women had choices in the work available to them. The women in this column were teachers, nurses, artists, business owners, government officials, and secretaries. Mickey Jones, was the advertising manager for Roland's department store. She had attended Bradley University and the American Academy of Art in Chicago before working at Roland's as a graphic artist. This very informative column laid out a career path for young women and expanded their horizons. Now in 1949, the Panagraph received an award for community, community service from the Inland Press Service, an organization for newspapers in mid-America. When receiving the award, numerous projects of the Panagraph were cited. The Better Communities Program for betterment of small towns in the Panagraph circulation area. The financial support given to the Lake Bloomington project by the Pantograph. The use of the Pantograph airplane to promote the establishment of the Bloomington airport. And the revelation of contaminated milk at a local dairy. And of course, the agricultural coverage, programs, and support of farmers' issues by the Pantograph. Out of 35 papers entering this contest, the Pantograph was unanimously chosen by its peers for the award. In 1939, the Pantograph provided a short information literacy project in news labeling to help readers interpret the news from the European war. This exercise was notable to other newspapers and was commented on in a professional journal. For one week, 
The pantograph headed each news article or opinion piece about the war with a label indicating the reliability of the piece. Labels such as verified, no reason to doubt, official action, informed opinion, or conjecture were used, which should have been a very useful tool to inform readers that not all news or opinion in the paper was of equal value. The paper further explained how the editors decided which label should be applied, giving readers further tools to assess the news themselves. The only objection the public had to the labeling project was when the panograph declined to continue it beyond the set week. Now, once the US entered the war, coverage of war issues was less objective. The images here are from a photo story on fifth columnists as portrayed by actors with the Playcrafters, a local community theater group. The panograph asked readers to be aware of the dangers of hidden spies and of how fifth columnists undermined the unity of American people and weakened our resolve. The objectivity of the panograph was being challenged once the US entered the war. Now we are always interested to hear from you here at the museum. If you see something in an image that we have not noted, like a building that is not well known or the name of a person, we want to hear from you. Please email us at images at mchistory.org with any information you have about an image. It's important to include enough information about the image for us to find it. I have shown here where the negative number is. This, well, sorry, I just ended my slideshow. And uh, the title of the image. Thank you for joining us today. And thank you for the generous support the digitization project has received uh, from all of you. We certainly hope that you enjoy the tens of thousands of images that are now in the collection and that you will support us in adding the remaining tens of thousands of images in our negative freezer. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rochelle. Um, if you have questions, if you wanna put them uh, in the chat function uh, for Rochelle, I know Rochelle, for me, uh, uh, one initial question is, uh, as you've gone through all of the uh, images, any surprises, anything that you note uh, in terms of um, uh, what uh, the panograph tended to uh, take photographs of? Well, it, it's a little, um, uh, well, we know all the photographs in the panograph were mainly of Caucasian people. They mm -hmm. did not focus very much on anyone of color in our community, although we do know there were many people of color in our community. So it wasn't particularly surprising, but it, it is something that is brought home to me every single day. Okay. Well, and it also seemed like some of the, photo, uh, uh, where today we kind of just get photographs uh, a little more uh, easily, um, it seemed like they were much more deliberate and focused in terms of, uh, getting photographs and who was in the photographs. They definitely, they were very focused on serving their community and you know, reaching people. They might have pictures of the mayors and the fire chiefs and everyone like then they did want to have pictures of those people, but they also wanted to have uh, people who didn't get the attention of the photographers every day or who weren't included in the news. Mm -hmm. um, they, they saw the importance of those people. Mm -hmm. I thought it was interesting that they uh, paid as much attention to um, uh, the um, um, the paper boys, or back then they were pretty much all paper boys. I don't think there were any paper girls at that time. Uh, I, they I seemed to take those uh, very important. They were very devoted to the carriers. I was really surprised looking at the family circle. 
when once you got about halfway through the 1940s, half of the family circle was devoted entirely to the carriers. Hmm. Uh, they were they were very important to the paper. I. I'm not sure if it was the focus of one person who who made that so, but they were truly treasured by the panograph. No, uh, we have a question in the chat from Art, uh, which said, "With today's digital tech, uh, uh, has the museum managed to stake a claim on the panograph's digital images?" I do not believe we have any access to the digital images, but I would not know that for sure. Okay. And of course, those are pretty much available because, you know, the papers out there digitally, as right. long as you purchase a subscription to newspapers.com, you have full access. Okay. Well, great. Thank you. Any other questions for Rochelle today? All right. If not, Rochelle, thank you so much. Uh, it was uh, really interesting seeing the, uh, uh, the old photographs and such. Uh, it was well before my time when I was here, uh, but uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, the one other follow-up uh, from uh, Art was with every phone being a camera, you could probably get millions of local images if you wanted them. Just go to oh, Facebook. Yeah. Yep, that's true. That's true. So anyway, well, thanks everyone. Uh, Jeff, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. And thank you, Art, for the questions. Thank you, Rochelle. I learned a lot today. Um, in particular, the, the powerful documentation, I had no idea um, about the series of around the town and on the road. And, and now I also understand why the pantograph has so many images of cats and dogs, <laughs> right? Many, many. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, Another one of my favorite is the uh, inner urban um, images as well. So we want to thank you and thank Carl. And I also want to thank our uh, curator of digital humanities who is working in the background back there, Tori Moray, who has a lot to do with this whole process because as we um, acquire all these tens and thousands of images, like you say, we have to have a place to store them, right? Right. And, um, and Tori's working on that for us, so. Um, again, we want to thank everyone else. If there was any more questions, I don't think there is. Um, I'm going to um, just remind you that um, we invite you to join us again next month uh, for our Zoom Lunch and Learn as we uh, look at COVID-19, the past, present, and the future, and the lessons that we learned here in McLean County. And we'll do that with um, Vicki Foltz, PhD in APRN, and Professor, Director of Rupert Chair School of Nursing, and Melissa Graven, BS and RN, and the Art Arnold Health Services of Illinois mm -hmm. Wesleyan University, Carl? Yep, that's correct. Yes, and um, we'll engage in a discussion on COVID's evolving presence in McLean County and the impact. So be sure to join us for that. And I'm gonna go ahead and put a link to that program in the chat here for you that you can pick up. And again, um, I really enjoyed this and I bet mm -hmm. it's been a lot of fun for you because you just never know what's around the corner, right? Yeah. It was very interesting to research. I, I learned a lot. Well, again, we thank you all and uh, we uh, bid you a good day. Great, thank you. Bye, thank you. Thanks everyone, take care. Thank you.